Father, we thank you for your word that's true in our lives. As we look into your word today, we pray that you open the eyes of our understanding to behold wonderful things out of your word. We give you praise, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. There's a walking in holiness. We as believers, we are called saints. What that means is we are holy people. Walking in holiness is something that we ought to do all the time. Holiness is not for Sundays. Holiness is not for just before I ask God for something. I need to make sure I'm holy. Holiness is not something reserved for the very few. Holiness is something that we all are created to walk in them. But when you look at how religion has defined holiness, religion has defined holiness as something that we have to work towards. Religion tells us that holiness is not something that we already have. So now you've been saved, you now have to become holy. Or in order to be saved, you have to become holy. Something like that is what religion would say. Do you realize that every religion proposes paths to holiness? You have to do this and this and this and this and that, and then maybe then you become holy. You know, uh, Leo was sharing with us during Holy Communion this morning that uh, what was he saying about holiness? That we are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God lives on the inside of us, but if you're feeling that you're not holy, it's because you, you, you're not being sure of who you are, essentially. Religion, pick any religion, gives you commandments so that you can become holy. So that, you you know, after you've done this and you've done that and you've done that, then you become holy. Then you become consecrated. And then you have levels of holiness. Hello? You have levels of holiness. Oh, the most holy man of God I ever know. I don't understand what that means. The most holy man of God. Right? The most holy person I know. The most holy person, you know, the most holy person you know is the one that stares at you in the mirror every morning. It's the one that lies in bed when you're sleeping. It's you. So what is holiness? Holiness is not our pursuit. Holiness is not what we're looking to get. If you're a believer, holiness is not what you're looking to get. Holiness is what you have been made in Christ Jesus. So holiness is not the... Let me say it properly. Holiness is not the cause of your acceptance to God. You're not acceptable to God because you are holy. You are holy because you are acceptable to God. Does that make sense? See, people, people, you go to people who have been around religion for a long time and you share the good news of Jesus Christ with them and they say, well, I would love to receive it, but I'm just such a bad sinner. I don't think I can live up to that. Well, if it's up to us to get to holiness, then Jesus did not need to come. Because the problem with the world is sin, and they couldn't separate themselves from sin. So God sent Jesus Christ so that he can take our place, and when he did, we were separated from sin and united with, Jesus, with, with, with God. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. And... Um, the people in the Ephesians Bible studies have been going, you know, 
just ecstatic over this book. And uh, they've been excited about the things that they're discovering. Are you in chapter 4 yet in the, in the book of Ephesians Bible study? Rachel is? <laughs> okay. In Ephesians chapter 4, so let's just do some sneak preview for the people in that Bible study. In Ephesians chapter 4, we read from verse 20. It says, but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, then it says this, that you put off concerning your former conduct or behavior, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit or the attitude of your mind. And I look at verse 24. And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true holiness, sorry, in true righteousness and holiness. So what is it telling us here? It says that we put off the old man. Who is the old man? Not your dad. <laughs> the old man is your old nature, the person you, you used to be. You know, when we become, there's something that we need to really learn, and I think maybe we should give it some time to study it, and that is the differences, and I know in a lot of our messages we've, we've taught on this, the differences between the spirit, the soul, and the body. If you can understand this, it will help you a great deal understanding the New Testament. Do you know that in most ancient writings, there's no distinction between the spirit and the soul? In fact, today, in our world, people do not know that there's no distinction between the spirit and the soul. And I believe that the reason... For that is because of what happened in the Garden of Eden. The spirit of man literally died. Death was lodged in man's spirit. He became completely out of alignment with God. And the soul and the body dominated him. So the most enlightened people you see outside of Christ are people who have developed their soul to some capacity to have rule over their body. The most brutish people you see are people who have let their body gain ascendancy over their soul. The most wicked people you see are people who have developed their soul in evil to the point where they're cold and calculated. But you see, in ancient writings, I read it somewhere a while ago, that outside of the New Testament, the use of the word, uh, uh, you know, we would call it pneuma. A Greek person said it's supposed to be nephma. It doesn't matter. I don't speak Greek. But the word translated spirit and soul is often used interchangeably in most writing because there's no distinction. But you know what the Bible says about the word of God? It says it pierces to what? The what? This, it pierces or it divides the soul and the spirit. It's the word of God that actually gave us a clear understanding that there's a difference between my soul and a difference between my spirit. Now, because, you know, if you want to read, I, I don't know if we have the resource there by um, Andrew Warmack on Spirit, Soul, and Body. I would endorse it. You can, you can start uh, get the material. If you don't, go find it and listen to it. It will give you a good and, and understanding of this. Right? But there's a difference between my spirit and my soul. When I was lost, my spirit was dead. That was the old man. It was corrupted. It was living a life ruled by the flesh and by my lost soul. That's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that he gave them over to the futility of their mind. 
The mind is futile outside of God. The mind will just invent things that are contrary to the will of God. Because my spirit was dead, I wasn't able to communicate with God. I wasn't able to know the things of God. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says the natural man, that is the man whose spirit is dead, he is natural because all that he had was his psyche and his flesh alive. His spirit cut off from fellowship with God. So it was natural. He said the natural man cannot know the things of God. Look, keep your hand in Ephesians chapter 4. Let's just go here. This is important as a, as a, by way of introduction. Are you hearing me with my voice? Should I shout louder? <laughs> Glory to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it tells us in verse 14, it says, The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are what? Foolishness to him. You see, this is why I do not understand why in our day and time, our churches are preoccupied with teaching believers things that natural men can understand. Because if natural men can understand it, it's likely not the things of the Spirit of God. Am I speaking to us? It says, look, let's read it together. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For their are foolishness to him, Look at the next one. It says, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Who is the natural man? Somebody whose spirit is dead. Somebody who does not have the life of God on the inside of him. Do you know the reason why the law was given was to point people to the fact that they lacked the life of God. In Galatians it says, if there had been a law given, that could have given life. Verily, righteousness would have come by the law. Wait a minute. You said a law given to, could have given life, but righteousness would come. Because life, the life of God, is the source of righteousness. Outside of the life of God, there is no righteousness. The law was given to show people that they were dead to God. Okay, so, but if you look, read before this, it says, it says, God reviewed, it said there's some things that uh, God has in store, if you read verse 9, it said, I has not seen, he has not heard, neither has it come to the mind of any man, the things that God has revealed to have prepared for those who love him. It said, but in verse 10, it said, but God has revealed them to us, how? By his Spirit. It says, for the Spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. How many of you know the deep things of God? You do? Who reveals it to you? The Spirit of God. So I hasn't seen it. Some, and some of you said, well, I, I, I don't know. I don't know the, the deep things of God. Those who raise their hand, they do, they, they're doing it by faith. They know that their spirit knows it, but not their soul. Not their mind. Their mind has not fully grasped it yet. I'm telling during worship time, I was telling you about the encounter I had with the Lord earlier uh, this week. Oh, what, what was Monday to Sunday? Whatever, S six days ago. And I don't fully understand everything yet in my mind, but my spirit does. Do you understand this? You see, we have believers today who are, their heads are this big and they're starving their spirit. Do, do, do you understand what I'm saying? Everything is my mind, my mind, my mind, my mind. Well, the way to illuminate your mind is through your spirit. Let your spirit gain ascendancy over your mind. 
Hello? Let your spirit gain ascendancy over your mind. Your spirit is the one that has direct connection with God. So it says, God has revealed them to us by his spirit. For what man knows the things, and some of your translations said the thoughts of a man. The, 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 the right translation is not thoughts. I mean, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Follow the logic here. In verse 9, it says, I has not seen it. He has not heard it, neither has it come to the mind of any man. What? The, can you look at your, the what? Things. Did it say the thoughts that God has prepared for you? But the things, not the thoughts. It says, but, but God has revealed them to us. What did God reveal? Thoughts to us or things to us? Said so for what no man knows, then the, the, now to make that argument even further, said for what man knows the things of a man, except the spirit of that man that is in him. So also no man knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Do you see the logic there? But because they had said, then look at verse 12, it said, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the thoughts or the things. The things which are freely given us of God. So you have your born-again spirit receiving things from the spirit of God, that God has prepared before the foundation of the world that you should walk in them. Isn't this exciting? This is, this is an exciting part of Christianity because there could be storms all around you and you're smiling and say, hey, I have the stuff I need to sail through the storm. I can speak to the storm and the storm can obey me because I am created to be just like my brother Jesus. Hey, oh, my brother Jesus? Yeah, he calls us brothers. He says, it's not a shame to call us brothers. My elder brother, Jesus. Glory to Jesus. He, he, look at it. He says, but the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. Cannot, 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 cannot. Yet we have believers today that the extent of their theology is that which can be grasped by Hollywood. Hello? So, oh, you know, we gotta, we got to be sensitive, secret sensitive. No, let's be spirit sensitive because the spirit cares about souls more than you and I ever have. Amen. Hello? Did I tell you a story of, uh, I'm sure some of you have heard this story. We were, we were doing campus ministry. Harry, you were there, right? Uh, Jeff, was, were you there? You know, I mean, when, when we had, we had a, uh, um, we have a Bible study on campus. This is years ago now. And um, a girl had just checked us out for the very first time. And she came from Northern Ireland. And I know that she's either, she's Anglican or something like that. Right? So she, that she does not know things like that we talk about. But she might have been saved at the time. But uh, she came for the first time. And at the end of the service, uh, at the end of the Bible study, I had a tongue and an interpretation. And the first thought in my mind is, not today. Not today. There's somebody here that I wanted to come back. Not today, Lord. Not today, Lord. Can, you, can we do this? Can it, be, can it just be prophecy? Can it just be a word of knowledge? And I can kind of talk about it like, well, if you're here and you're kind of thinking about this and God might be saying to you about this, so I can just be, you know, normal. <laughs> you know, and uh, Harry says, I'm normal, thank you. <laughs> um, and they said, well, tongue and interpretation, not today. We're trying to grow this Bible study, not shrink it. And then there's another person here, and you might know Gail and Ricardo, I think I can say their name. You know, they were dating or engaged, I'm not sure, dating at the time. And Ricardo, that was his first time at the Bible study. And they came in, and I was like, okay, I'm not concerned about them, but I'm, <laughs> I was more concerned about 
the one that I know is not exposed to this supernatural type of Christianity, which is the only real one. But uh, so now I had a tongue, so I said, well, in the Bible, there are gifts of the Spirit. One is called tongues, and another one is interpretation. So I believe that God has a message for somebody here tonight, today, tonight and I'm going to speak in tongues, and I'm going to expect to interpret it. So I spoke in tongues, and now think about it. I spoke in tongues. I myself got concerned because I felt frustrated. No, no, I, I spoke in tongues. That was fine. And then when I was going to interpret the tongue, I myself got concerned because I felt frustration. And I said, this doesn't sound like God. But I'm like, no, I, I, I'm doing what God wants me to do. So I, I interpreted. Then I spoke in tongues and I interpreted some more. Now it sounded more like God. But the first word that I said that didn't sound like God to me was I felt the frustration and I said, you have said, it is enough. It is enough. I'm like, I don't know this. My brain was running through all scriptures where I can find where God says, it is enough. None came. But, and then I interpreted and then God was speaking to somebody and giving them instructions and talking about stuff and, and comforting them. And then I closed my Bible and I thought, for sure I blew it. For sure, well, maybe not for sure. Likely I blew it. And likely it's nice to have met that one person, but we're never going to see her again. I said, well, it might be for you or for somebody that you know. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, you started putting some disclaimer on this thing. You know, or you could say, maybe I missed it. And, uh, and uh, Gail started crying. And I'm like, okay. And then when she came through, she's like, Oh, we're discussing some things, and I guess we're going through some stuff. I don't know the details. And she said, those are the exact words. It is enough. It is enough. Basically, I've, it, this, this, whatever the situation is, they fight enough of it. And she said, those are the exact words she said before they came in for the Bible study. How did you, how did I know that? I couldn't know. I mean, I was putting my disclaimer on already. But see, that's how the things of the Spirit of God works. I'm going somewhere with this point. Because the late, and then the next week, Jen, Jen uh, Jenny, that's the girl's name, she showed up. And then she showed up. And anywhere where we have meetings, she showed up. And she said, can, can I be discipled? And some of the girls took her through going deeper in Christ's program. You remember Jenny? You know, you know so, I mean, she went through that program, and then later we became friends. And then she said to me, she said, one day she said, Moses, you know, I kept coming back because on the first day I came, I saw something supernatural, and I knew it was real. So you see, rather than me trying to hide the things of God, living in it, God is the one that's most sensitive to people and the things that my mind tells me will alienate them from the kingdom of God are the things that draw them into it. Glory to Jesus. It became a center point that got our attention. And then after her, we started getting other people that are coming from, as a student from Germany and all kinds of people that they're getting saved and coming. Now, I mean, things started happening. Hey, what if we what we have shied away from being real? Hello, that person would have come, would have fed their head, and they would not have had an encounter with God. Remember, she did not say, "I came back because you were such a good teacher, and I really understood that Bible study that you did." But she saw something that was supernatural. Am I speaking to us? So the Spirit of God is more sensitive about souls than you and I are. I remember uh, last year, last November, we were here and there was a gentleman, I believe uh, she's, I forgot, Hindu, Buddhist, I don't know, was here. And God revealed something about him 
that no, he has never told anyone. I mean, okay, that's the spirit of God. We're having coffee, Harry and I, we're having coffee with somebody else from church at a Tim Hortons. And then we're trying to talk about a song. So one of us, maybe I did, somebody sang the song to kind of remind, we're talking about a song. And a, a girl sitting next to us said, oh, I remember that song. He, uh, my, uh, when I, I used to go to church and then we start, we have an opportunity to share the gospel with them. But the boyfriend was kind of resistant, didn't want to talk to us. And then I was like, can we pray with you? And so, and just before we prayed with them, I looked at the boyfriend and I said, I believe that God is speaking to you. Do you mind if I say something? And she's like, reluctantly allowed me to. And said, so there's something. And I told him about something that he's never told anybody before. I said, there's something that made you mad at God, that you don't want to have anything to do with God. It happened in your childhood. And said, so, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. And then and he gave me a story. And said, so, oh, yeah, this happened. And I looked at him. I said, that's not it. I said, there's something more. And then because for, I always like to respect people's privacy, so I didn't dig deeper, but I, I gave him an int. I said, this is what it is. And his face just, remember, his face just dropped. <laughs> what is that? It's the Spirit of God helping us to effectively minister to that person. Now, I could have been there, cool, right? Tight jeans. <laughs> Don't, no, no, try not to imagine it. The pastoral team have seen me uh, wear a tight jeans. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a picture here. Oh. No. Hold back, hold back, hold back. <laughs> That you would not be able to get out of your mind. It, was, it wasn't good. You know, not for me. You know, but I could have been there trying to act cool. Maybe do a, a couple of rap songs. Nothing wrong with tight jeans. Well, I don't know. If I, I definitely know something is wrong with tight jeans on me. Right? But the point is, I could try to try and do things in my own ability rather than letting the Spirit of God. Reach out to people. Again, that's not the point we're talking about today. Let's go back to it. So the natural man cannot know the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. The natural man is natural because the spirit is dead, but your spirit is alive because you're in Christ Jesus. Okay? So let's go back to uh, Ephesians chapter 4. So what it's saying here is that put off, now that you're born again, you, you, you see, some people think that when they become born again, the old person is still there, and the new person is also there. And the old person and the new person are always trying to fight for control. That when I do good, that's when I yield to the good person, the new. When I do bad things, it's when I yield to No, it's not so. What is left is the memory of the old man. So look at this carefully in Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 22. It said that you put off, put off concerning what? Concerning your former behavior, the way you used to behave, right? So it's kind of like this. If you were living in a house, and we say a computerized home, that everything in that house is done with a computer. Who programs the computer? The person who lives in it. So you can program the computer that you want the light on at a certain time of the day. You want the sprinkler on only in the summer, not in the winter. You guys have a sprinkler on your lawn. It's, I assume it doesn't go on in the winter, right? So it's winterized, but, you know, but it's, it's computerized, everything, your, your music. You know, you put it out and, you know, oh, I want to wake up to this type of music and so on. I want to go to bed while this music is playing. You know, during the day, I want to hear new creation, church messages, whatever, you know. But if you're an old man, you probably want some other things, right? So the person programs the house. The house is your body. The program is your soul. You are you. The person living in the house is your spirit. 
Now, when we got born again, this is analogy, so it, may not, it, it, it has limitation. When we got born again, the old man died. A new man was created. Now, the fact that the old tenant is no longer there, a new person is now living in the house, will that change the computer program? Hello? Will that change the computer program? No, the computer program is still what the computer program is. But the other thing too is that the computer program also is connected to the World Wide Web because it's here on this planet. So that means junk still comes in. That means the house still wants to behave like it used to behave. Your body still wants to do the things that it used to do. So this is what it's saying here. It said that you put off concerning your former conversation. Reprogram your computer. What if you say, oh, well, sometimes, you know, this, is, this happens because the, the tenant, I still allow the tenant. No, the tenant is dead. He is no longer living here anymore. You are now in charge. So take control of what's going on in your mind and take control of what your body is doing. That's what it's saying here. It says, put off concerning the former behavior, the old man. And then it goes on here in verse it said that you put off and then and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. See? And that's what we do. And that you put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So yeah, so you put on the new man. But look at it. It said the new man is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. That means you were born in Christ Jesus. You were created Holy. So what does holiness mean? Holiness really, what it means is that you are consecrated. You are set apart. It's kind of like what we do with things. It's like, oh, I'm going to put this aside. I'm going to, this, you know, it's kind of like you wanted to give somebody something. You literally put it aside. You wrap it. You put the name on it. In a way, that thing has been consecrated to that person, has been set apart to that person. It's still in your house, but you have chosen to set it apart. If it's food, you're not going to have your lunch out of it. Why? Because you've set it apart. It's kind of like what we do with our income and, um, and our giving. We set apart a certain amount. I was like, we're going to give this. It's setting something apart. So holiness is setting something apart. Uh, you know, I read it. Uh, it's, it's the apartness of something. It's consecration. It's uh, the effect of being consecrated. So I am holy not because of what I did. I am holy because I have been set apart. Who set us apart? God. God set us apart for his own. There's an old song we used to sing that said, uh, you know, um, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, uh, something else. With thanksgiving. I'll be living sanctuary. Right? But that, but that song, it's an Old Testament song because it doesn't tell us the truth about us. In Christ, we have been set apart. Right? So I am not going to become a sanctuary, holy and acceptable, but I am a sanctuary, holy and acceptable. He is not preparing you to become holy. He did that by one sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4. Uh, let's just go there. Yeah, turn it up, turn it up. So now, now uh, I've run out of time. So you definitely, we need to, um, we need to come back here. We need to come back here. Okay. Where am I? Where am I going here? Hebrews chapter 2. It says, 
<laughs> Look at verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to what? To glory. To glory. When did he do that? On the cross. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Look at verse 11. For both he who sanctifies... And those that are sanctified, and I know that many of our translation would say those that are being sanctified. The correct translation of the word used is sanctified. But this is where, when they, when they translate, oh, I'm not sanctified. So they thought, okay, it might mean, it must mean being sanctified. So their own, uh, anyway, so those that are sanctified are all of one, for which reason it's not a shame to call them brothers. Do you see this? It's saying to us here that we have been sanctified. We are no longer waiting to be sanctified. What does sanctification mean? Sanctification means to be set apart, to be made holy. By one offering, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. He said, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. Again, some of your translation would say being sanctified. So we are created in Christ Jesus holy. So what is all this legalism and all these do's and don'ts to push people into holiness is because people do not realize what they already have. So in order, if you don't know what you have, you go about trying to establish it. You know, Paul talks about the children of Israel. He said they, they did not know the righteousness of God, so they went about creating their own or establishing their own righteousness, my paraphrase. And that's what happens in a, lot of religion, in a lot of Christian religion. The Methodists came, they said there are two distinct work of grace. They said the first work of grace is salvation. They said the second work of grace is sanctification. But there's a lot of work between the two graces. <laughs> You've, re, you've been saved by grace, but to get to the second work of grace, you got a lot of work to do. <laughs> you got to pray, you got to fast, you got to do this, you got to do that. And I will hear people come up and say, oh, and then finally the word, third word, second work of grace came in and the root of sin was taken off and I became sanctified. No, you became sanctified the moment you became born again. God called you as his own and set you apart. So what does it mean? It means that we are holy. We are holy. It says to us that know you not that you are the temple of God, which is what? Holy. Is that the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. See, holiness is not the cause of our acceptance to God. Holiness is the result of our acceptance to God. Somebody will say, Moses, but how, does, well, how do you explain the passage that says, uh, without holiness, no man shall see God? Exactly what it says. If you don't have the fruit... If the, if the result is not in your life, it means you have not been accepted. You've not come to him. You've not called unto him. Amen? So some of us are looking at our lives right now and trying to make ourselves holy. That's the wrong way to go about it. What we do is we accept the fact that we are holy and then we learn what we need to do to keep ourselves holy. Hey, let me re re rephrase that because that might come off wrong. How do you keep yourself holy? Is being yourself. He's being who you are. He's recognizing that you have a born again spirit that needs to rise in ascendancy over your mind and over your flesh. All of us will be tempted. 
But when your spirit is gains ascendancy over your mind and over your soul, you'll find out that you will rise above the temptation. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 tells us what we need to do. It says, I beseech you therefore, brothers and sisters, that you present your bodies as what? As a what? What is the one criteria, what is the one condition of a sacrifice? It's been set apart. It's been consecrated. It's basically saying, I'm sacrificing this. How many of you, you know, but you know what? It says for us to be a living sacrifice. Don't kill yourself. Don't kill yourself. But be alive, but be dedicated. Present your body as though this has already been offered on the altar. It's already been offered. What we find a lot of believers doing is they're crawling off of the altar. <laughs> it's like, can, can I have that sacrifice for the weekend? I have a party to go to. Can I just borrow that sacrifice? No, I have a hot date coming up. Can I just, uh, just, just borrow the sacrifice just for the date? Hello. So present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Verse 2 tells us what we do with our soul. It said, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do you do that? How do we do that? Well, we can get into it, but I'm way out of time. Shall we rise together this morning? Amen. Amen. What do we have? We have grace. By grace, we've been transformed. We're now holy. We're not trying to become holy. That means next time when temptation comes, just remind yourself, I'm holy. I don't want to mess this up. But even peradventure, if you were to do something that is contrary to your nature, if you were to sin, which is contrary to your nature, you remember the blood of Jesus. His son cleanses us from all sins. Don't let the enemy keep you under the bondage of guilt and condemnation. You come back. You remember, just always remember this. How did you become holy in the first place? Did you do anything? Who did it? So if you're ever in short supply because of your action, you feel like, oh my goodness, I've messed up. Remember, you did not do anything to qualify for holiness. So to get back into, space, into the place with God, it doesn't cost you anything other than what it already cost God. Amen? We're not here because of our own excellent record. We're here because of, of his perfect sacrifice. Amen. Let's just bow our heads. If you're here today, said, I want to know that I've received that gift of righteousness, that holiness. I want to know that my spirit is indeed filled with life. Just wave at me. Anybody here? Anybody? Just wave. Anybody? Praise God. I want to know Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Praise God. But if you're joining us on, on social media, on the internet, or wherever you're watching us, you can pray this prayer with us and just say with me, Father, I come to you today. I know I cannot save myself. I'm a sinner. But I ask that the Lord Jesus will come into my heart. I believe Jesus died for my sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day. I believe he is my Savior. I confess him as my Lord. And my Savior, thank you for forgiving me and separating me, setting me apart for you. For you. I'm holy. I'm washed. I'm a saint in Jesus' name. You know, that's what it means to be born again. 
What you've just said might sound like a simple prayer, but something supernatural has taken place on the inside of you. If you're in the greater Toronto area, come and check us out at New Creation Church and be a part of this assembly. Or or find a Bible-believing church, spirit-filled, grace-teaching church, wherever you are, and let the Word of God continue to develop you. Amen? You know, the Spirit of God is here. And just before we close, I want us to use our own mouth to take authority over sickness in our own bodies. Can we just do that before we close? So everybody, let's just stop anything else that's going on right now and just take authority over our own body. You know, your body, your, your body recognizes your voice. Hello? Your body recognizes your voice. And right now I want you to say and be bold about it and just say, Father, I thank you for Jesus. Jesus took my infirmities. He bore my diseases. By his stripes, I was healed. Therefore, I speak to my body right now. Hear the word that I speak. You are made whole. Sicknesses have no place in this temple. This temple is holy. This temple is washed. This body has been set apart. Therefore, sickness, go. Infirmities, go. Disease, go. I speak to my mind. You are made whole. My brain functions properly. My mind functions properly. My eyesight are restored. My nasal passages are clear. My tongue is healed. My throat is healed. My digestive system is made whole. I command tumors to go. I command pain to go. I command diseases to leave. My bones are made strong. My blood is purified. My veins are made whole. My arteries are working properly. My lungs are proper. They're healed. They're clear. I speak to mucus buildup. Clear off. I speak to my heart. You are strong. You are healed. You are perfect. I speak to my stomach. My kidney. I speak to every other anatomy. You are made whole. My feet are strong. My ankles are strong. My limbs are strong. My shoulders are strong. The healing power of God is flowing through me. I am healed. I believe I am healed. I believe I am healed. My ears are working properly. My eyes are working properly. The hair of my head grow back in the name of Jesus. Skin ulcers go. Skin cancers go. In the name of Jesus, I am made old. I am made strong. I am healed by the wounds of Jesus. Let's just give the Lord Jesus praise. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus.